There are two main gaping holes in law school education. What are they? That's the topic of today, and it wouldn't be a very long podcast if I actually just went ahead and told you what they are right now. So I'm going to just talk for a minute. Uh, there's birds in the background. I'm recording this at the end of the day, and the birds are going a little bit mental. So sorry, but I won't be editing them out, because if you've ever done that, it's a real pain. This is Chris here from tipsforlawyers.com, and this is the Tips for Lawyers podcast. Welcome and thank you. I appreciate the time you're spending listening to me. I hope it is an informative and enjoyable time. For this particular podcast, it might sound like I'm talking to law students, but in fact... I am talking to young lawyers, and I'm talking to people who are mentoring young lawyers, because if you are involved in helping grow a new or early career lawyer, then you need to approach it for from the context of where they're at. And if you are a new or early career lawyer and you're using this podcast as something resembling a bit of mentoring, then I hope this will give you a bit of information that you can take and run with so far as areas to focus upon in the formative years of your legal career. Where are we going to go? We're going to first talk about what the areas or issues actually are. And principally, they fall into two major categories, as I hinted at at the start. And there's no big secret here. The missing pieces in law school education, so far as I'm concerned, are both contextual issues. The first is commerce, and the second is client. What do I mean by either of those things? Let's take commerce, I guess, as the easiest and first example. As you go through law school, a number of things become apparent. Firstly, you can spend an unlimited amount of time between the moment you get a task and the moment the task is due to complete that task. There are no other external restraints upon your time. Now, of course, you need to sleep and you probably need to eat, and you probably have other subjects. But within the context of what you're doing, you could, in theory, take an assignment from day one, work on it for 72 straight days, and then hand it in. If you do that in a law firm, a number of things will happen. Firstly, you will get fired. Secondly, you will overbill your client. Third, you will be making poor decisions. And fourth, you're probably going to have a mental breakdown. So, Commercial context first rears its ugly head in the way in which you value your time. Because law school really gives you no commercial context to what you're doing. And if you are an employee of a law firm, you need to take that commercial context into account because you're costing someone money merely by turning up to work during the day. Most law students end up costing their firms money in some way or other. Now, they offer value because they're usually billed to the client one way or another, whether or not your firm has time billing or not, those costs are assumed by your client. So by and large, if you spend too much time on something, your client is paying for it or the firm's client is paying for it. And that is not a good thing. But it might be a necessary thing. So what you need to start to develop is an appreciation for how your time is valuable, both to your firm and to the client who is paying your firm. Because while you are working on one task, you cannot simultaneously be working on another task. And so this is where the commercial context comes into play. You might have task A for lawyer A, and they might have said it's an extremely urgent task and they need it done by the end of the day. You might estimate it takes two hours to do, which means it's probably going to take four hours to do. Then you get task B, or you get an opportunity to do task B from perhaps a lawyer you like better or a lawyer you think has a more interesting task, and they say it's a one-hour task and I need it done by lunchtime. Do you take on the task? Do you say you have capacity? Do you indicate that you've got the urgent task for the other person that needs to be done by the end of the day? Do you ask questions? Do you just get them to speak with each other? How do you approach that? Because if you do not get that task done, there are consequences to people other than yourself. So what are you going to do with that? information. How are you going to assess the work that you should be doing? Now, by and large, the general approach recommended to law students is that's not your problem. Let them sort it out amongst themselves and give you the priorities. And that is certainly the safe option. 
But that's not the case every day. What happens if you've been given a task, you've been told it ought to take an hour, and in fact it takes four and a half hours. So you've spent more than four times the amount of time which your firm is paying you to do a task. Do you go back to the person after an hour? Or is that embarrassing? Is the fact that they told you that it's an hour mean that in fact you're slow or stupid or you're not getting it or you should have done it a different way? These are the concerns that start to come up. And the commercial context and the way in which you function is going to offer you some important guidance so far as your decision making is concerned. That commerce, the ability of your law firm to make money and the ability for you to contribute to your law firm making money are imperative career decisions that you need to get a handle on. So if you have absolutely no clue how a law firm makes money, which you probably don't if you haven't worked in one and you don't have a business appreciation for it, start watching and observing. What goes on the bill? What happens to your time? If you have time billing, is your time getting written off? Is it getting billed? Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? What is the most profitable area in your law firm? Are there certain types of work that are not profitable? Are there certain partners or lawyers in your firm who seem not to have profitable practices? How can you tell what is profitable and what is not? Is a big team necessarily a profitable team? Is a team that bills a lot of time or sends a lot of bills out to clients necessarily the most profitable team in the firm? Is the firm making more money from conveyancing than it is from litigation, than it is from insolvency or taxation or insurance or plaintiff personal injuries? How are these things working together and how does that affect how you do your job and how you can deliver value to your firm? I cannot give you all the answers in a podcast. My job here today is to make you think, what is the commercial context of your job and where do you fit in to the business side of things so far as your firm is concerned? The second missing element in law school is your client. Now, I know that many law schools have a little bit of client pretense. You know, they might have a client interview, piece of assessment or something like that. But by and large... You have no client contact and you don't care to have any client contact. And frankly, most people would be terrified to give you any client contact, even if you're volunteering somewhere or working in a firm at the time. The difficulty with this stems in how you deliver your legal services. And this is where legal writing really goes absolutely mental because you haven't learned how to write something to a client. You have learned how to write something to a lecturer or a tutor or a marker or an assessor, whatever it is you have in your jurisdiction. You have not learned to communicate with a client. And I can tell you right now that the biggest difference between law school assessment and client evaluation is that clients are subjective and law school is not. By its very nature, the education system has adopted a love affair with objective marking for various reasons, all of which probably make sense, but none of which reflect reality. Your clients will mark you subjectively, which means that client A might throw an advice in the bin, whereas client B might consider it to be the best advice in the universe. And your ability to determine between who's an A and who's a B is very important. Now, sometimes... And in fact, often, I'm going to go so far as to say, a lot of lawyers, even senior lawyers, absolutely make no distinguishment between client A and client B. And personally, I think they're doing those clients a massive disservice. What it goes to show is, frankly, the lawyer doesn't care how the client prefers to have their legal services delivered, nor do they care to take into account the context that the client finds themselves in, in delivering their advice. This is why you get letters of advice that all follow a set formula rather than ones that are catered to the circumstances of the client. A 20-page letter sent by email to an elderly lady with reading difficulties who doesn't get email very often or doesn't know how to use it. Do you think that's a good advice? That kind of thing happens all the time. A phone call to a client who prefers text messages, a text message to someone who barely uses their mobile phone, a letter to a PO box for someone who only checks it twice a week, We don't bother to find out how our clients prefer to consume their information. But beyond that, how much information does your client need? 
how much is really written for you, the lawyer, rather than for your client? Because the client probably just wants the answer. And if you're giving them 10 pages of legal rhetoric, is that actually what they wanted? Is that serving their needs? This is where law school goes off the rails because communication has to reflect the needs of the client. Now, there is a balancing act there because sometimes it needs to reflect a certain amount of protection for your firm, the butt covering elements of a communication, but your client's context is extremely important. And this is where subjective elements of legal practice come into play and where law school, frankly, needs to do a lot better job. Practical training needs to be far more centered around assessing people and what people are like and how to go about judging what people's expectations are and dealing with people than it currently does. At the moment, it is almost entirely focused upon the law and how you, in isolation from any context of your client, can deliver legal decisions or legal advice. And that, I think, is a bad call. That is the kind of thing that is going to be replaced by robots. And if you haven't listened to my podcast on that, I suggest you do. But that is the exact kind of approach to law, taking the client out of the context and approaching things as if it's a law school exam that only bad lawyers stick with. Now, at the moment, that might be what you have to offer, and that might be a large part of your job to do, for example, a, a file note or a research memo or an assessment of a case or something like that. But that's very different to when it comes time to communicate with a client or to give them good advice, because different clients might warrant different advice. A 32-year-old in business trying to feed his family might have different legal advice from a 65-year-old about to retire and move to the Bahamas. They might have different contexts, and you cannot advise them if you don't know those contexts. So if you take nothing else away from this podcast, firstly, the chances are you haven't gotten this far, but if you have, and you're just sort of letting the words wash over you, start listening now. As you experience more and more of the law, as you get a job, as you get into a law firm, observe the context that you find yourself in. Observe specifically the context of commerce. How does your firm make money and how can you play a part in that? And the context of your client. Who are the people who seem to be serving their clients extremely well? And who are the people who seem to be more obsessed with their own approach to things and couldn't care less what the context of their client is? You will learn either way from watching the good and the bad, and you might disagree with me and you might decide to go in a completely different direction. But if you don't think about it, then nothing will change. Those are the two massive areas of deficiency in law school so far as I see them at the moment. And you can do something about it. That's the best thing. You can do something about it by simple observation, by learning, by being open to considering what more there is beyond simply what you've learned in law school. It's Chris here signing out. This has been the Tips for Lawyers podcast. Head to tipsforlawyers.com slash iTunes. Leave a review, leave a ranking, say something nice. I appreciate them all. I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. Hopefully I'll hear you or see you or speak to you, whatever it is, next time.